Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm Daisy Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the feature book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Thank you very much for having me today. My name is Isabel Reddy, and my novel that came out in June of this year is called That You Remember. It's historical fiction. It toggles two time periods, 2019 and 1970. The majority of the novel is in 1970. It depicts the months leading up to a coal impoundment disaster. It is loosely based on the Buffalo Creek disaster, February 26, 1972, in West Virginia. But there are numerous types of disasters, and I wanted to detach it from any one single event to make it a more global applicability. Okay, here's a reading, and it is not from the very beginning, but it shows a scene with miners and one rookie miner who had started his work in the mine that day. So what's this about a meeting, George asked. I damn well hope you sons of bitches aren't striking again. Some other miners joined them and Donnie made the introductions. Rhino, Robert, Painter, this is Harvard, also known as Pete, our new red hat. After Sarah took their orders, George leaned over and asked, are you okay? She smiled and gave him a pat on the back. Robert said to Pete, Heard about you. How was your first day? Ready to hitchhike back to wherever you came from? His greasy hair flopped in his face. Tipping his chair back, Pete said, not today. Anything unusual happened to you? Asked Rhino, who was missing a front tooth. Pete reached for his Coke, and that's when he noticed his wrists, black between the ends of his sleeves and where the gloves had been. It hadn't come off in the shower. Nothing that I can recall. Pete tuned out what the miners were saying. Instead, he remembered what had happened at the dinner hall where they'd had their lunch. He'd been expecting something the whole day because Sarah had warned him, and he paid particular attention to where he stepped. For safety's sake, he'd chosen a seat with his back against the wall so they couldn't come from behind, slip a rat down his jacket. He'd already seen the rats, big as small dogs, but he didn't mind them, knowing that they could feel a tremor, a rock fall about to happen. The sight of them was reassuring. He remembered Benny saying they had feelers. Still, he didn't want one stuck down his shirt. The dinner hall was a small space cut into the wall, better lit than most of the mine. Some of the miners had actually brought in folding chairs. Pete leaned back, his muscles twitching from exhaustion, and thought maybe he'd get off this rite of passage easy. He'd been so busy watching every move around him that he'd almost forgotten to eat. The other miners were about done. He chased his bologna sandwich with the rest of his water from the bottom section of his dinner bucket. Someone next to him gave him an elbow and said he shouldn't finish his water. Pete asked why. He'd been parched and his throat hurt. Shaking his head, the miner gave Pete a long stare. Ain't no one told you? Oh, because I could get trapped and need it? There's another reason. Pete waited. That's how we survive down here. Stick together. If you see something wrong, you pour out your water. That's our sign. If any one of us pours out our water, we all leave. It's a safety thing. You think they care one shit about us? They got numbers to make, that's all they care about. Pete nodded. Well, at this point, I don't think I could tell if something is dangerous or not. It all feels dangerous to me. Yeah, you'll get over that. We rely on each other. You might be the only one to see a crack or hear a shift or see some dust fall. And you've got to trust that. No one plays around with pouring their water out. The miners packed up their lunches and put their wrappers and trash back in the garbage can. Everybody looked so casual to Pete that he doubted the hazing that Sarah had hinted at would happen. The miners weren't paying any attention to him, no sneaking looks, little smirks. Pete noticed nothing until he reached for his cap. That's when everything went dark. The place was blacker than black. He felt around with his foot for his cap, but they must have grabbed it. There was no light. He hadn't heard any click of a breaker, but obviously this was a well-coordinated trick. Every miner shut off his cap light at the same instant. He stood, desperate to find a spot of light, but also to be ready to run if he had to. 
darkness like he'd never seen, a chasm of darkness without gradations, no place of grayness, no hint of light, uniform blackness. For a moment, he wasn't sure if his eyes were open, so he rubbed them. Where were the miners? Why weren't they reacting? Pete felt dizzy as if he might fall. He spread his legs wider and put his hands on his hips to ground himself. Here it is, he thought, looking quickly around. Thank you, Sarah. At least he was forewarned. Afraid to move, he waited. Of all the things they could have done, he told himself, if this was it, he'd be okay. Darkness wouldn't kill him. At least he could hear the noisy generator. If he had to, he could grope his way towards it. Tense as a rod, he didn't know what to expect. Would they push him, shove him, throw their lunch scraps at his head, jump into a buggy or a tram and desert him? Time seemed to have disappeared along with the light. Couldn't tell how long he'd been suffering like this. He could hear the hum of the conveyor belt and the sound of the motorman somewhere far off in the mine. It was a strange sensation, total darkness. He opened his eyes wider. Then someone grabbed him. Get your hands off of me. The miners broke out in cackles and hoots. Someone shouted, darker than the grave. Peals of laughter led some miners into coughing attacks. Not a speck of light. Like no darkness on earth. Still no lights. Wanting to end the prank, Pete yelled, turn on the goddamn lights on the veggie fuck off, man. He loaded on the expletives, but it didn't work. 100% darkness, someone said, laughing. No, you've never seen this before. Then he heard Donnie say, come on, boys, let's go. Leave him here. A day or two should do the trick. That was too much. Pete shouted every swear word he knew. The lights came on. Donnie walked by, handed him a decal, laughing. He said, put it on your cap, Harvard, so you can find yourself in the dark. For a long time after, Pete's heart had galloped like a wild stallion. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm so thrilled you guys are joining us today. Hope you enjoyed that reading as much as I did. I can't wait to find out what happened to poor Pete. <laughs> if you're new to the podcast, make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We have amazing authors every week with incredible books they're sharing with us. If you're interested in supporting us and bringing more authors to your listening station, go ahead, join the patron community, become a patron junkie. You get to see the behind the scenes, unedited videos of everything that happens that you don't want to miss out. And because you're here to listen to another amazing author, we're going to get started. Hello, Miss Isabel. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, DC? I am wonderful. Welcome, welcome. I am so excited you're here. I have tons of questions, so we're going to jump in. Historical fiction. Mm -hmm. I need to know what made you decide to write about that genre instead of anything else you could have picked? Oh, well, I have loved historical fiction for a long time. I was a Howard Fast groupie, just read everything of his, and a teacher as well. And back in 1999 to 2000, that year, the high school curriculum included reading a essay by Kai Erickson from his book, Everything in Its Path, where he went into the Buffalo Creek region and wrote about what had happened and what the cleanup and the devastation was all about. So I taught that. And it's more than just reading it, say, a magazine in a doctor's office, because the students built dioramas and did reports, and we really delved into that. And, and so that began my interest in that particular event in history. When you decided to go ahead and put all these pieces together, so for all of our listeners, historical fictions can be very tricky because if you're not getting the facts correct, it can get kind of muddy. So how much of the story is accurate to what happened during the event and how much you took some liberties in creating these characters? How did you went about it? Well, that's a great question. And you're so right. All along, what I wanted was for this book to hold water, to use that phrase, for the people that lived in these regions. To that end, I have gotten confirmation from not only local people in the region, but also soil reclamation experts at universities, that this is a very close depiction of life then, of the conversations, of what goes on underground, and that kind of thing. Yes, it's fiction. You gotta have fiction to put together a story and have it hold water. 
but realistic too. Because what happens in my story, and some people even can put this in the genre of a romance, I had to have the two worlds knit together, the coal executive world and the coal hollow. Where could a coal executive meet a local person and found it very clearly. And I have my two characters both have an interest in fishing. So they actually meet at the river, but then they can see each other in the local diner slash hotel that's in the region. How long did it take you to put this story together? Because you're going through a lot of facts. You're going through a lot of information. You're pulling from different sources. How long was that process to gather everything to put this novel together? This took a decade to write. 10 years. Many trips to the Coal Hollow regions, many conferences, the Appalachian Writers Network, many eyes on this, people reading it as a favor for me and editors. And I also went into mines. And (laughs) that was not my favorite part of this because I don't like going in small spaces, but I went into a coal mine a demonstration mine in West Virginia and also one in Wales. So I went all the way to Wales and over the years just gathered so many books, so many reference books, so many personal monographs of what it was like, even women miners that helped me, that I found everything I could possibly read to put this together. My heart goes out to you because I don't know if I could have done it. Like, go into a mine. I'm like, yeah, I'll take your testimony. How about I record that? That sounds great. Me physically go there? Ooh, that's a tough one. Very much. I went with a great friend of mine. She was all into it. Oh, my gosh. But in a way, it really helped me write what it was like for Pete because he was a rookie, new to the region, had come down and got a job in the mine. So I could put myself into him and what was going through his stomach when he first went in there. And that is huge. Those real emotions, because you know what it would be like. If it was your first day on the job and it sounds like you you read a piece of paper like, hey, you're going to be a minor. It's like, how bad can this be? And then you go down. Exactly. Exactly. He had been pumping gas or emptying boxes and went down there to live with his grandfather and work in the mine. and And he had really underestimated how much is involved, how much you need to know, how dangerous it is. There's just so much to it. I love the scene of pitch blackness because I don't think if you live in a city or anywhere that has electricity, there's never truly pitch blackness. Like you have clocks lighting, you have anything you plug in gives out some kind of light. So that essence of it, there is nothing there and you're in complete space of you don't know what's around it. I'm like, I'm terrified for you and I'm not even there. Like, I don't know how you did it. Yeah, that did happen to me. That was one of the little fun things they did to us when we were in the little tram car. They cut the lights without telling us. Big joke. Darkness like you've never seen or never will see again. Absolutely. Yeah. It is a feeling of emptiness that as humans, we're so not used to now in our days. So I love you took these experiences and you put it into your writing and you brought them to life because I'm like, Oh, yeah, no, that's not me. Sorry. I would need another job somewhere else. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Eyes are not used to not having something to fall on. And that's what's so disorienting down there. Among a million other things, the noise, there are just so many things. I am completely blown away. Hats to you for deciding to, like, I need to physically experience. I was like, I would have taken some of these notes. That would have been great. As a writer, you have committed a decade to bringing these stories to life. What was one thing you learned, besides mining my nubby feel for many of us, that you were very surprised about, that you're like, oh, I didn't see this happening in my journey as a writer? Well, one thing was going to West Virginia to these coal hollows 10 years ago when I started. There's no cell phone signal. And they told me, this very kind woman said, don't go that way. She said, Google tells everyone, don't go that way. She said, I'll meet you, X, Y, Z. I said, well, can I use my cell phone? She laughed, no cell signal. So she said, meet me a mile past the tipple. And she said, you know what a tipple is, right? Because here I am saying, I'm writing this book. I have to tell you, I lied a little bit. I said, yeah, because I thought I could figure it out. Well, I was so wrong because there are 4 million things down there that could go for whatever a tipple is. And I kind of knew a tipple is the production plant, but I didn't know anything. So I say I didn't know a tipple from a pickle, but 
to answer your question, what really amazed me was the people, the people in those regions, the kindnesses, the generosity of their time, sharing their stories, showing me things of everybody really that I met. And here's an example. When I was leaving Kentucky, you had so many turns before you get to a highway, so many. And <laughs> I'm not great with directions. So at one point I pulled over, I'm like, oh wait, did I turn left? So I turn right, I'm trying to reverse my direction. Someone stops, she goes, do you need some help? I said, yeah, because I need the baba. She said, oh, do this, do this. And here's my cell phone number. And then when you get there, my cell won't work. But I need to give you my son's cell phone number. And if you get lost, I just couldn't believe and that kind of thing and really opened up a new world to me, especially if you live in cities where you might hesitate at the green light, you're not sure which way to go and their cars are piling on you. It was such a different world to me. You got so. to experience a side of the United States that I think sometimes people take for granted where people do wave when they see you in the street, even then when they don't know you and they still want to help you. I think sometimes the cities have made us so jaded to like look at people in the eyes, like, oh my God, don't do this because you don't know what's going to happen. But you got to feel and experience that and be able to put it in your writing. So I love it. I'm glad you found your directions because I'm directionally challenged too. <laughs> well, it's true. The sense of community was wonderful to experience. And I've begun to put that not only in my book, but in my life, become involved more in my community. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I love the fact that your book just transcended so many different barriers and you got to experience it in your life and how to bring it forward. Mm -hmm. Tell me, madam, what else are you working on now, now that the book is done, that you got a breath and what is your next plan? Well, I'm an MFA, Master of Fine Arts student in creative writing at Goddard College in Vermont. And part of that will be that I turn in a final finished piece. So I'm working on a new piece of fiction. It will not be historical fiction this time around. I could get into that next, but so I am doing something pretty different. Very nice. Yeah. Congratulations on going back to school and getting it. I'm afraid that is a whole entire journey that I'm like, oof, you're one brave lady because that's a lot of work. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. It's fun to do what you love. That's the catch. As long as you're loving it. Question, Madam, what advice would you give an up and coming author who's interested in tackling a project as big as what you have done? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I will say that the precipitating event, too, in writing this was finding a survivor on YouTube who read her poem. And she is a woman about my age, so she was pretty young when it happened. She was a teenager, but she wrote this poem and it got in my head and she inspired my whole book and inspired my lead character, Sarah, in my book that you remember. And that was the end of her poem. She said, she re was repeating, I can't forget, I can't forget, you know, I can't remember. And that was kind of a, a refrain in this poem, how when we go through these things, we don't want to remember, but forgetting is a way that it could be repeated. And it is important to remember these things. So I would say to people, when you feel inspired, even if it's on your computer or, or YouTube or something you see in the real world, maybe follow it up, follow it up. Because that's what happened to me. It just grew in my head. That is such a great advice. Everybody asks where people get inspiration from. Sometimes a video, a YouTube video might trigger an entire novel. So I love the fact that you follow through and you let that seed just take place in your soul. So I think that's amazing. Question, madam. Where can people find you? Where they can learn more about this book? Where they can get more from you? Tell us. Oh, well, thatyouremember.com is my website. So you can go there, read the blurbs and purchase the book. A couple of different ways to purchase it. Or Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Or the publisher is Bell Isle. Press, which is an imprint of Brandy Lane Publishing. The people can grab the book everywhere and get a whole entire immersion in this world, find out what happened. I love the fact that you decided to take a tackle and actually let yourself enjoy this process, which is even better. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Madame, are you ready for the lightning round? Sure. Easy peasy. Let's see how you do. Candlelight dinner or breakfast in bed? Breakfast in bed. Nice. Wizard or pirate? Pirate. 
That's awesome. Documentary or fiction? Fiction. Series or standalone? Standalone. Okay. Here is a little different. Let's see how you do with this one. If you could meet any dead person, who would you like to pick? Oh, man. I'll have to say Charles Dickens. Okay. Why? Do we tell? Such a rich brain, really. I mean, his descriptions, his depth of understanding, his love of writing. <laughs> oh, I love it. Madame, it has been a pleasure having you on this show. Do you have any closing remarks? Been a pleasure for me, too. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Appreciate it. And it has been such a fun time to our listeners. Go ahead, pick up this book. Start following the fabulous Miss Isabel. You want to get involved in this amazing historical fiction. And make sure that if you're new to the show, go ahead and follow us. Remember, we have new authors every Monday of this season, so you don't want to miss out. Bye, everyone. <laughs>